man. You know, I, 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 I've been uh, looking at uh, doing a message on the Holy Spirit, and so that's what we're going to do today, called the work of the Holy Spirit. But I went through, I was going through my notes, because I'm thinking to myself, oh, I, I know I've preached about the Holy Spirit, so I'll go through all my notes, and, and you know, maybe I can, you know, I, this is a little different, but still maybe glean a few things. And I went through my notes, at least back to 2011, and, um, and had nothing. I was shocked. I, I was absolutely shocked that I, I had nothing as far as a message concerning the Holy Spirit. Now, I know I talk about the Holy Ghost and other messages, but a message just concerning the work of the Spirit of the Lord, I had nothing. So we remedy that today. All right, we remedy that today. So our message this morning is the work of the Holy Spirit. And our first scripture is going to be found in John 16, 7 through 15. Now, what I talk about today has nothing to do with that scripture, but that scripture is going to come into prominence down the road. Okay, so but let's look at, look at John 16, verse 7. Je this is Jesus speaking. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, now he, he, calls, he says it's a he, amen? And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you, know, and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the rule of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of the truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. A couple of things in there. Uh, notice, and, and, and uh, that he calls the Holy Spirit he, a person. And, and so really before we can talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to talk about the Holy Spirit himself to have a clear, concise understanding of who he is, all right? So let's find out who the Holy Spirit is. First and foremost, the Holy Spirit is God, all right? He is God. And Jesus did not say it, he said he. And the reason he said he is because the Holy Spirit is a person. So you have the Father who is a person, the Son who is a person, and the Holy Spirit, who is a person. Now, we call that, or we call the Godhead, or God, we call the Trinity. And, but you will not find the word Trinity in the Bible. That word is not in there whatsoever. Now, some folks try and say, oh, it's got to be in it. No, it's not there. Trust me. You can, look, you can Google it, look it up. Trinity is not in the Bible. But he is what we consider and, 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 and this is not in ranking, this is just simply in just an expression, we, we consider the third part of the Trinity. He is a person. He is just as much of a person as the Son of God is and as the Ancient of Days the Father is. Those three are God. Now, I want you to understand, we don't serve three gods, we serve one, but I'll get to that in a minute. Trinity means a group of three. Uh, the state of being threefold the threefold personality of one divine being that's just a definition that's not a biblical that's just a definition of the word trinity listen to what the bible says in deuteronomy 6 4 hear o israel it says hear o israel the lord is our god the lord is one jesus said this over in mark 12 29 the foremost is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The whole point is that Jesus himself has declared that God is one God, not three gods, not two and a half, not one and a half, one God. We serve one God, and he manifests himself as the Father, as the Son, and as the Holy Spirit. Each one is a person. Each one is, you can say, distinct in their responsibilities and duties, but when it comes to their mindset, they are the same. 
Does that make sense to you? When it comes to their agreement, their, 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 their walk, they are the same. In other words, the Father is not going to do something different than the Son and the Holy Ghost. The Son is not going to do something different than the Father and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not going to do something different than the Father and the Son. Each one, are going, they're going to do the same thing, but they are, I, I, I guess the, the best way to, to uh, um, I'll give it an illustration in a minute, but the best way to say it is God has revealed himself through his word, his, and, and it's hard for us to grasp because it's hard for us to make that distinction as to how can there be three persons and yet they are one God. And it, it be, it, it's tough for us to see that and understand it and, and to walk in that. And, and especially for those who have an unregenerated mind who do not understand spiritual things, it really becomes tough for them to understand it. Even some religious folk don't quite get it. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, what's the... Um, Jehovah Witness, they don't, they don't believe in the Trinity. They, that, that, there's no such thing. There's no such, no matter that the scriptures, even though the word is not found there, the scriptures reveal to us that they, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's what the scriptures reveal. They still deny that fact because it's hard for them to begin to understand how there can be three persons, yet there's one God. But here again, that, oh, that's in a whole other plane or dimension of existence that we don't have an idea of how it operates or how it works. We understand how our plane of existence works. But now you're talking about the, the, the plane of existence where God resides, heaven. We, you're talking about a whole different God who is above all dimensions. How he can do that, guess what? He can because he's God. If he decided to do more than that, he could have done more than that, I'm sure. But for, for whatever reasons, he decided he's going to be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, three persons, one God. That's his decision. Guess what? I'm fine with it. How about you? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good with it. So, and because God has revealed himself as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, here again, three persons, one God, I want to show you just in a few scriptures, uh, even how, how, how the scriptures you know, uh, bring that together and, and reveal that. It says in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus makes that recognition. He says, you go to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Now, this is after his resurrection. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, Jesus again, but the helper or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So here again, Jesus is letting them know that now you have me, the son of man, but when I leave, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. We're going, to send, we're going to send God again to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be with you, and he is going to bring back to your remembrance everything I said so that you can speak to other people and let them know what, you know, what I've said and, and, and teach my gospel. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, this is what the Bible says. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, Jesus is the Word, the Logos, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, a lot of times we can, we, can get a, uh, uh, we can get three people together and we can try and become one in thought and one in idea and, and to work on a project or whatever the case may be. And then a lot of times we have, might have the same objective, the same goal, but we still have some different opinions and so forth and so on. Not so with Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are no differing of opinions. There's no, let's get around the coffee table or the, the conference table rather and hash out until we come up with a plan. No such thing. They are all, they walk the same walk together. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, over in Luke uh, 3, 21, we see Jesus being baptized. And notice what it says. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, as he was baptized, being baptized, he was praying. While he was praying, heaven was open. Does that mean everybody saw an open heaven? No. What it simply means is something supernatural happened, and other people didn't necessarily even see it, but Jesus saw it. Heaven was open. There was, a, there was an opening that happened. I, you can call it however you want, whether the sky rolled back or whatever in his, in his sight or whatever, but heaven was open, 
And through that opening, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. It came down, lit upon him like a bodily form, like a dove, and then, and, 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 and then poured over him. All right? And, uh, and a voice then came out of heaven saying, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Notice the reason I bring this scripture up because notice what happened at Jesus' baptism. You have God the Father saying, you are my beloved son, and uh, you I am well pleased. You have God the Holy Spirit coming and, and fully immersing Jesus in the, uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you have the Jesus, the son, who is God, who is being baptized for his earthly mission. So we have, here again, you, you, they, we show, even though the word Trinity is not there, we see in each case, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's, all, that's the only point I want to bring, bring to you on that, is you begin to see and understand this is biblical. It's not something that somebody made up and we've just been preaching for 2,000 years. This is a biblical concept uh, of, of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When somebody comes to you and says, I don't believe in, in that Trinity business, that's okay. They don't have to believe in it. It's still so. God is still God, and he still manifests himself, and he can manifest himself any way he chooses. Amen? Here again, he is not three separate gods. He is not three separate gods. One God who is the Father, who is also the Son, and who is also the Holy Spirit. Now, we... And here's, and here's how we understand it, because the Bible says that everything that is in heaven, everything that is there, God has made a like or kind, a like kind of it on earth so we can understand how things are, so we can have at least some understanding of how things are in heaven. And for the Trinity, or for Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he's made a like kind. It starts with Genesis 1:26, when God says, let us make man in our image. First off, let's examine that. He says, let us. He used the term, he didn't say let me. He said, let us. So who is he talking to? Was he talking to the angels? Well, no, because they had no hand in creation. There's no place in scripture where you find angels had any hand in creation. If you go back to Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, not God and the angels. Genesis 1, 2, it says the earth was out form and void and the spirit hovered over the deep. All right? So the Holy Spirit had a hand in creation. Am I right? Because he hovered over the deep. All right? The, the, the Son of God, the Word, had a hand in creation because he, God said. God said. And when the Bible says in Genesis 1, and God said, what it's actually saying is the Son or the, the Logos of God, He, that is, that we call the Son of God, Jesus, He then created. He spoke. He was the spoken word that came forth. And when He said, God said, let there be light, then when God said it, the spoken word went forth and made it. You get it? All right, all right. I hope that, I hope that explains it. I, I can explain a little bit more if you want me to. But, but, but and, and that's the open. So now we get to Genesis 126, and he says, let us make man. So he's not, you don't find angels here again having any part of creation. You find only God handles all of creation through the Father, the Son, the spoken word, and the Holy Ghost, the power that hovered over the earth. Amen? So now... He says, let us make man, us. So he's talking, so they're talking to each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's make man in our image. Here again, something on earth reflects the Godhead. Who's that? That which God made, humankind. So he made man out of the dust of the earth. And then the Bible says that uh, he breathed into man and man became a living soul. Male and female created he them, so forth and so on. So he, he breathed in him, he became a living soul. And so now we understand something. We understand that man has a body, the dust of the earth. Thus you came forth, thus you return. Right? We also know that he has a soul. Because he became a living soul after God breathed into him, right? So now we know he has a soul, which, uh, which is part of your, your, your will and, and your mind and all that business. And we also know that man has a spirit. How do we know that? Because God breathed. God breathed. 
So the life of God, the breath or the wind, the breath of God came into man, giving him a spirit, then giving him the, the combination of that and the, and the flesh get, made him a living soul and he also had a body. So we can see that the same thing that God has revealed himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, man is the same way. And we are united. Now sometimes we have, because of, of sin, we became disunited. But initially we were united as Father, I mean as a body, soul, and spirit, just like God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in the beginning, there was no conflict between body, soul, and spirit. Why was that? Because man's, Adam's body was perfect. His soul was uh, de delighted in God. And his spirit came from God, with, and it was, it was not corrupted. So there was no corruption, and he walked as a, a united uh, being in, in full harmony with himself. Sin came along and created disharmony. That's why it becomes hard for us to kind of see and understand the, uh, the, the Godhead because we as individuals, not just, you know, three of us persons here in this room, but just as a triune being myself, I'm in such disharmony, you are in such disharmony, that it's hard for us to see how can Father, Son, Holy Ghost be in that kind of harmony. And here I am, I mean, I'm, I'm body, soul, and spirit. I'm just one guy and I can live in harmony with myself. And we can't, we don't. Even as saved people, we don't live in harmony with ourselves. You know why? Because even though I've been, I've been born again, all right, and my mind, my soul has now de de delights in God and the law of God and I seek to do the things of God, but there's a war that rages inside of me, Paul says. Paul says that we have a war that rages inside of us and that is the war between the body, which is corrupt, and the soul and the spirit. And there's a pulling, there's a tugging, there's a fight to see who's going to be in control. And so, you know, even as saved individuals, we have that struggle, we have that fight. Even unsaved people have that struggle and that fight. They're not walking as individuals in unity with themselves. They're not walking in unity because sin won't allow them to walk in that unity. Even though they're sinners and they, and they, 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 they oh, well, they might, they might revel in sin, but still there's a disunity about them because that's what sin does. Sin equals chaos. Sin brings chaos. Sin brings disunity, discomfort. That's why Jesus said the devil's role or his desire is to do nothing but steal, kill, and destroy. Any and everything that is this disunity, any and everything that, 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 that takes and tears down, that's what he's about. And so even a worse sinner, that's what they're about. If they can't do it to themselves, they're going to do it to somebody else. But they walk in disunity. Even as saints of God, we are not walking in unity. So when people say, oh, the church has to be in unity, I'm going to tell you that's going to be a tough situation because we still have human. I'm not giving an excuse. I'm just simply saying we still have human bodies. And we're still warring a war within ourselves, let alone now trying to, you know, uh, uh, be with everybody else and then every other church and all gather together and sing Kumbaya. I'm going to tell you, that's going to be a tough situation. Not that we, not, I'm not saying we shouldn't try. I'm not saying we shouldn't work toward that goal. I'm not saying that's something we shouldn't do. I'm just simply saying understand and realize that, you know, people say automatically, well, we all serve the same God. We all have the same Holy Ghost. We all ought to be walking in unity, case closed. Well, no, because we, each one of us still has a body that we're warring with. We still have a, a flesh that is coming against us each and every day. While you're woke, while you're asleep, it doesn't matter. Your flesh is fighting you every single day of the week and every minute of the day. And you can't get around that. That's not how we start it. We start it as a reflection of the God in heaven on earth. We started as a reflection of him. We were his reflection. We were to be what God, uh, throughout this universe, what, uh, uh, to, to show who God is and what he's all about and how he, how he manifests himself. We were those people who were going to do that until sin came in. And then sin destroyed that. And so now, what, through Jesus, what, what are we doing? We're fighting to get back there. We're, and I say fighting to get back there because we're still growing into the image of Christ. 
See, we started out in that image, and we didn't have to do, we didn't have to do anything to be in that image. Adam started out that way. He didn't, have to do, he didn't have to do a thing to be the image of God. Not one thing except obey God, live, exist, and do what God said. He didn't have to work his way there. He didn't have to try and get to be there. He was already that. So see, the devil lied to him and lied to Eve when he said, oh, you'll be like God. He didn't realize he was already the image of God. He was already that image on earth and reflection of God from heaven on earth. And so that, but, but now we have to fight to get there. Am I right? And it's the Holy Spirit's job. That's where his, where his work comes in because it's his job to take you step by step, let, rung by rung, level by level, to get to that place where now you are reflecting Jesus in your life more and more, putting down the flesh, raising up the spirit, amen, and living and becoming the image of God to a lost and dying world. Why, why, why does he want you to do that? Because as you become more like his image, then others will see the power and anointing of God in you and through you and recognize what God, who God is and what he's doing, and then they will come themselves and join in and be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, do, and do likewise. And it's a continual process. We are to be that, but it takes work. It's a fight. You got to fight your flesh every single day. You got to, as, as Paul says, I get under my flesh and I pull it into subjection. I put it in a hole that it cannot break out like the rest of the United you know, like the wrestlers do. They get you in a hole if you like, watch MMA and all that stuff they get you in a hole that you can't break out of and you got to tap out. Well that's the whole objective to get your flesh to tap out. To get your flesh not to be able to reverse the hole and then get a hold on you because when it gets a hold on you then it has the upper hand and it's going to do what it chooses to do. And that's a fight we face every day. I'm not trying to make it sound like, oh, man, you know, oh, we're, well, we're just losing that fight. No, no, we're winning. We're winning. But, it's st but you cannot be relaxed. You cannot stop and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to fight today. Lord, I'm going to take a break today. I'm going to take a rest day from the, from the spiritual struggle. No, you can't take a rest from the spiritual struggle. Because the minute you lack, you know, you know just, just ease up. That's when the enemy comes in and, and pounds you even harder. He catches you when you're not looking. And you, listen, the enemy doesn't fight fair. He cheats. He cheats. In that arena, in that arena uh, of the flesh versus the spirit, trust me, ain't no referee. There's no referee. He cheats. He'll do anything. But you've got to stand strong. And with the power of the Holy Spirit behind you, you can win each and every battle. You can win each and every round. And so because we're made like God, we then reflect the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as one God. And like I said before, it's hard for us to envision that because we have so, we have, we have so much disunity in our own, just in our own bodies, in our own flesh, in our own selves. We're fighting the fight. You know, uh, the temptation comes and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. And the flesh says, come on, let's do that. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know you want to. No, no, that's what you want, but that's not what I want. And that's why people say, well, if Jesus defeated death, then why do we have to die? That's why you have to die. That's why your flesh has to die. You don't die, but your flesh has to die because it's corrupted. And it has to, be, it has to die in order to be reborn throughout when Jesus raises, uh, you know, raises us from the dead, to be reborn so that now it can be raised incorruptible. And we can then once again be exactly what God intended us to be from the very beginning with Adam. Isn't that something? All this, so we can go right, right back to that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But God's plan, see, that was God's plan. And God's plan is never, he, he doesn't give up on his plan. He doesn't say, oh, they didn't do it. Let me chuck this. No, he doesn't give up on his plan. He says, I'll take them through all that so we can get right back to where we started and we can do what we're supposed to do from the very beginning. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about because it's about, what was Adam about? Adam was about spreading the kingdom of God throughout the universe. Throughout the universe. You want to see an alien? Look in the mirror. That's you. You're the alien. No, I'm serious. Because you're as alien as you can be from the original intent that God had made us for. 
They're looking for signals and this and that, and they're trying to say aliens seeded the planet and made us. And they're just they, anything, anybody but God. But the truth is, God made us for a purpose to fulfill his kingdom, to push and expand his kingdom throughout the known universe. And whoever knows beyond, I, don't, I have no idea. But he made us for that purpose and that reason. And guess what? He's going to take us right back to that point, And that's what we're going to have to do. Amen. Praise God. I love it. Uh, so we're made like God, not angels. Angels don't have, the angels are not a reflection of the image of God. Only we are. Um, and here again, I, want, I, I just want to emphasize the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father and as the Son. He is a person. Now, the Hebrew and Greek word for spirit means wind or breath. And I already talked about that when God breathed the breath of life into man. So that breath, that wind, that, 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 that uh, uh, and the Greek word is called um, um, pneuma. And that's where we get our word pneumonia and so forth for air, for wind, breath. Well, and he breathed that breath of life into man and man became a living soul. In the Old Testament, one of the things you'll find about the Holy Spirit is he selectively came upon different individuals or selectively filled people like Moses. Moses, of all uh, of the people that came out of Egypt and were in, uh, in the desert, Moses was the only one filled with the Spirit until it got to be too much for him judging all the people. And God said, select 70 elders. He said, then I'll take the measure of the spirit that I have put on Moses and put that measure on all 70 of these. See, one of the things you need to understand about the Holy Spirit is he comes in measures. If I, I don't know if that might be the correct way to say it, but I think it helps you understand that, you know, Jesus had the full measure of the Holy Ghost. But, you know, all of us don't have necessarily the same measure. And what I mean by that is, you know, we don't all have the same giftings and callings and anointings and so forth. He, but, but every single believer has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So uh, Moses had uh, a measure of the Spirit. God took that particular measure and put it upon all 70 of the elders. And all 70 of the elders began to prophesy and, and, and so forth. And so for the rest of their lives, they had that 170th of the measure that Moses had upon their life. And, and that's how God worked uh, uh, in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. In fact, over in Judges chapter 14, here's a good example for you. Uh, verse 5, it says, So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise... A young lion came roaring against him, jumped out and came against him. And the Spirit of the Lord, notice what it says, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. So Samson had a measure of the Holy Spirit that did what for him? Gave him great strength. He didn't have a whole lot of wisdom, but the measure of the Spirit of the Lord that he, he did have gave him great strength. It strengthened him in his body. And it says, came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart, with his, with his bare hands, as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. So here's a case where the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, what had God said to his father and mother prior to him being born? He said he would be a man of renown. He would be a man of great strength. And so from the day he was born, the Spirit of the Lord was on him for strength. To the point, and, 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 and then we know that, you know, his, listen, his strength was not in his hair. People say, ah, oh, his strength was in his hair. His strength was not in his hair. His strength was in the Holy Spirit. But the command given was that no scissors would ever touch his hair. His hair would not be cut. Once the Nazarite vow was violated and his hair was cut, then he broke, the, the, the vow was broken. And when the vow was broken, the great strength didn't come back upon him from the Holy Spirit because he had a broken vow. Y'all understand my point? So his strength was not in his hair. His strength was by the Holy Spirit and a vow that had been made by, to, from God to them and from them to God that they would not let anything, they would not break the vow of him being a Nazarite all of his life. So now when he did that and he broke the vow, he, now he lost his Holy Ghost strength. 
until he was in the temple of Dagon, the, the god of the Philistines. Between the two support pillars, they were making fun of him. And the Bible says they made sport of him. They made fun of him. And they had gouged out his eyes so he couldn't see. They had him chained to the pillars. And they made fun of him. And ah, la, 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 la. And he, so he tells, he tells the young fellow, he says, can, can you place my hand on the, on the pillars? Just, you know, can you? And, and they did. They placed his hand. Now, not realizing what he was going to do. And uh, by this time, his hair had begun to grow back. In other words, he, did, he, 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 he repented. He, got, he restored his vow restored his vow and when he placed his hands upon those pillars he called out to God he said God give me strength one more time give, me, give, give it to me one more time and let me die here with my enemies and God granted his request and he pushed those pillars with his great strength can you imagine what kind of strength it took that was strength more than to just rip a line apart with your bare hands the strength it took don't, huge granite stone pillars that were holding up an entire temple and the strength it took for him to push 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 until he pushed those things apart and the entire temple fell imploded fell inward and everybody in there thousands and thousands and thousands of people it said he killed more than his death in his entire life thousands and thousands of people crushed on a big stone, two, three, five ton, ten ton stones, crushed, mangled, dead. Because now he had restored his vow. That says something to us. That's why the, that's why the story is there. But it speaks to us that, number one, we keep a vow. But also it speaks to us in the fact that we need to know that whatever our abilities, whatever our strength, whatever we have, it comes from the Holy Spirit. It says, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. It's the Spirit when you, you may not, it, it may not feel like, you know, whoo, oh, that was the Spirit of God. It, it, you may not feel a thing. You don't have to feel a thing. That's not necessary. But God, you got to know, whatever idea, whatever thought you have, whatever thing that is, it is, uh, that is uh, 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 awesome and wonderful from God, you know, uh, you know all those things, they come that it enable you to move forward. You got to understand all that is the Spirit of the Lord coming upon you to give you those ideas, to give you that thought, to, to take you to those places. In the New Testament, we understand that the Spirit of the Lord dwells upon every believer. The Bible says in Acts 2, 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance once again it's by the spirit it's according to the holy spirit and now here's and the good news is every single person who accepts jesus christ as their lord and savior believes upon him for their eternal salvation they are going to be filled or have the spirit dwell within them that is the promise of the comforter that's what that's what jesus meant when he says i'm going to give you another comforter um i didn't tell you what the word comforter means did i It's in here somewhere. I'll get to it, I guess, eventually. But, <laughs> but you know, so the, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon every single believer. Now, here, God has revealed him. Listen, God has revealed himself to us through his Spirit. He's revealed himself to you through his Spirit. Give you a scripture for that. 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never came by the will of man... But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So every, here again, every gift was healing, deliverance, prophecy, uh, a word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Every single one comes by the Holy Spirit. So as you're speaking, as you're ministering, as I'm speaking here, this is all by the Holy Spirit. It's not based on what Pastor Dave says. It's based on what the Holy Spirit. Now, I can, I can hijack that, of course. Like, you can hijack whatever the Spirit of God says. You can hijack it. You can say whatever comes to your heart and your mind. But if you allow the Spirit of the Lord to have his way, you're going to say the things that the Spirit of the Lord would have you to say. You're going to say what, because he has a message message that he wants to bring through you to others he has a word that he wants you to share he has a he has a way he wants you to live to influence others he has a way he wants you to speak that's going to influence others he, he has a way that he wants you to walk and talk that will influence others he has a way that he wants you to do things because everything by the spirit of the lord is designed to give glory to god and draw men unto god 
And Isaiah, <laughs> now, if, it hadn't, if it's not for the Spirit of the Lord, and, and I, 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 when I saw this scripture, let me read it, and then I'm going to tell you something. Here, here's the scripture, it's Isaiah 59, 9. It says, therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as, uh, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl, growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. I was looking at that scripture, and I thought about the fact that had not the Holy Spirit reveal God to us, that's exactly what we would be. That's exactly what we would be. Looking for light, but only walking in darkness. And if you look at the world we live in, that's exactly where they are. They're groping and not finding. They're, 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 they're in blackness. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're in a desolate place. And, and, and I'm not saying that with glee. I'm saying that with sadness because all they have to do is turn to Jesus. All they have to do is turn to the Lord and say, you know, forgive me, cleanse me, I, I, I believe. But yet and still what we find and what we see constantly is anybody but God. Anybody, you know, let it be here again. Let it be the aliens, let it be this, let it be that. Let it be anybody but not God. And they have just, a, let, it, let it be the Muslim and Allah. Let it be the Hindu. Let it be, you know, anything but why can't it be God? Why not? Simply because, simply because when you, ha when, you ha when you submit yourself to God, when you look to him and you say, okay, I know I'm wrong, that's the first thing you have to do is admit you're wrong. You have to admit that you're wrong. And when you're not willing to admit that you're wrong, when you're not willing to admit that you don't have the answer, when you're not willing to admit that you've been going down the wrong pathway, you've been living the wrong life, when, you're on, when you want to justify the, the desolation that you've been living, you're not going to turn to God because with God you have to admit he's right and you've been wrong. Such a simple thing, isn't it? Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. But we have such a hard time admitting that he's right and we're wrong. We can't even do it with each other. Oh, come on now. We can't even do it with each other. How many times have we sat there and argued people down knowing we were wrong? Or somebody comes to correct you, whether it's on the job or wherever, and they come to correct you and say, hey, no, you know, uh, don't do it that way. We need to have it done this way. Well, I, and all of a sudden now you get defensive. All the walls go up. You get defensive. Now it's, you know, no, no, uh -uh, no, I've always done it this way. The last boss I had, he let me do it this way. Now you're making all kinds. That's not the issue. The issue is this guy says, who's your supervisor, says, no, that's not what I want. We have, a, listen, we have a hard time just, ex can we be honest? <laughs> we have a hard time just acknowledging our wrongness on something that's insignificant. It has no eternal implications. It may, it's nothing no more than, you know, what it is, a, a memo, a paper, or this, or that, or work product, whatever. It, it, it's, it's, I mean, here today, gone tomorrow, and yet, ah! So how much more are we willing to admit to God that my whole life has been wrong? And even if we, we might even admit a part of it has been wrong, but I, and we hit, throw the caveat in, but I did some things right. <laughs> I, I, I did some things right. Come on. I, I mean, I went totally all. Listen, listen, come on, folks. You've been wrong, all wrong, totally wrong. Me, all of us. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong. 
The only thing we can do is throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and cry out for mercy. And say, Lord, forgive me, I've been wrong. Not, I, I, I was wrong sometimes, but you know, a few times I did okay. I can imagine, I can imagine, I can see it in my mind's eye, people standing before God saying, well, Lord, I mean, I wasn't totally all messed up. I mean, I did help a few ladies, old ladies across the street. That guy that sat on, sat on my corner all the time and begging, I always gave him a buck or two. I, I mean, I, I did right. Yeah, but your deeds, your deeds, no matter how they make you feel, no matter how the world says that's a good deed, is nothing but filthy rags unto the Lord. Because it's not a matter of the few things you think or you perceive or the world says that you did right. It's about faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the thing you seem to fail to understand. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It is our faith in him. So no matter what I've done, whether I perceive it right or wrong, in God's eyes, because I wasn't in Christ, I was wrong. And until I get that right, me and Jesus, I'll be wrong. And the only way I'm going to be right is the Holy Spirit draws me to him and I repent of my life. You know, we have people, we have people come up to, to get, get saved and we tell them, that, you know, and part of the prayer we normally have them say is, forgive me of my sins. We ought to be saying, forgive me of my life. <laughs> forgive me of my life, Lord. Because it has been totally jacked up. Totally jacked up. Because there's nothing, listen, I got, you need to know this. There's nothing in your life before Christ that is salvageable. Nothing in your, say, I, boy, we ought to preach this all over the world. There's nothing in your life before Christ that is salvageable. God is not saying, well, okay, I got your sins there, but you know, I can salvage this and I can salvage that. God is saying, I'm not salvaging nothing from that pitiful life. See, we don't like to hear it like this. And it, it, because we, we still hang on. We still have that, 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 that hope that, 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 you know, I did something right. I, 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 I did something right. But you have to understand, in sin, no matter how right you were in sin, it's still wrong with God. And until you get with Christ and, 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 and submit to him, then you can begin to live a right life before him because now the life you live is a life in Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, footsteps ordered of the Lord. Y'all get where I'm coming from here? Until that time, this is wrong. I pray to God that this DVD, video, whatever, touch it, hit somebody and touch them because people, that, this, they need to hear what I just said. They need to hear it because too many people are operating under the illusion, even in church, operating under the illusion that before Christ, they had something that was worth salvaging. You had nothing worth salvaging. God is not in the salvage business. He doesn't take old junk and then work on it, put it in the workshop, bang it out, and make it look nice. He's in the business of taking your old self, obliterating it, and making you new. And that's why I like Isaiah 59.9. That's why I put it in this message today. I'm going to stop right here. But that's why I put it in this message today. Because, see, it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates and lights up. It is the Holy Spirit. That's part of his job. That's what he does. He illuminates and lights up for us to see 
when you go and speak to somebody or when you live in a life of Christ before people, when you're when you're speaking, when you declare, when you when you let the spirit of God work through you, be your life, your voice, your everything, when you do that, then somebody's going to say to you, "Hey, how do how do you how do you make this? How do you do this?" And then you have the opportunity to say, "It's only through Christ Jesus whom I serve." And when you say that, listen, when you say that to somebody, it is a light going forth into the very deep recesses of their spirit. And it begins to light them up. And for, first, and for many people, for the first time, sometimes, not, not to say nobody's ever said it to them before, but maybe the time you say it, the light penetrates. And for the first time, they're able to see instead of groping around and being in blackness. And they're able to see and say, whoa, wait a minute. Man, I am desolate. I am a man most pitiful. <laughs> I'm a man most pitiful. I, I, I got to do something about this. And you may be the very one who leads them uh, because of what you say by the Holy Spirit, that light that lights, the, they, they are lit up and the Holy Spirit then draws them into the Lord and they repent and get saved. I mean, it, you, you just never know. But that's why we have to be ever vigilant to live a Holy Ghost filled life. Because that's what he does. That's how he uses you. He gives understanding of the word. Amen. We're going to stop right there. I've got, I've got more and we'll, we'll continue this next week. And I'll, I'll share this with you. There's a point at the very end of this I'm going to get to that I think is going to rock your world. And I don't think I'm going to get there next week. It'll probably be two weeks from now. But there's going to be a point in this that's just going to, that's going to rock you because I shouldn't say, maybe it won't. Maybe you don't know it. I don't know. But it's, it's going to help you understand some things even clearer. You think times are bad now? You ain't seen nothing yet. You think things are tough now? You think things are crazy? You haven't seen anything yet. There's, a, there's coming a point, and the scripture plainly speaks it out, and I'm just going to reveal it to you uh, at, toward the end of this message, and toward the end of uh, this, this series, what, what, what's going to happen. And it's, it's, it's definitely not comfortable, but it is going to happen for sure. Amen? All right, we're going to take this opportunity to uh, have you stand on your